Good morning and welcome to the Hub City Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. As the Hub City Church, we exist to make disciples who believe the gospel, abide in Christ, and obey the word of God. If you'd like to hear more about our vision, get plugged into serving, or learn how you can get connected through community groups and men's and women's ministries, you can visit our website, thehubcitychurch.org, or just text the word Hub City to 97000 and we'll follow up with you in the next few days. Our annual beach baptism celebration is coming up in just one week. If you're interested in getting baptized, we would love to talk with you. You can sign up for baptism at the link on our social media post. As we get ready to worship through singing, we just want to remind you that kids are always welcome in service. There are coloring sheets and crayons in the back of the sanctuary should you need them. Also, we have a nursing mother's room with our service streaming live just outside the lobby to the left. Again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship Jesus together. Well, hey, good morning, guys. Welcome again to this gathering of the Hub City Church. We're glad that you're with us today to worship Jesus. Man, I feel like with that intro, like I need to wear black like every time for like this like beachy, I don't know, like I need to wear something ominous. So anyway, all right. Well, hey, a couple of announcements really quick before we get to the word. The first thing is um, Jacob just mentioned it. uh, His great offering talk is beach baptisms are coming up uh, Sunday, September 1st. That's Next Sunday, right? Wow. So here we are, uh, up on the end of uh, summer. We always go out to Henderson Beach State Park for a time of uh, baptisms for those who have uh, recently professed faith in Christ. Uh, If you believe the gospel that uh, Jacob just so clearly presented, uh, if that resonates with you in a new way, you're beginning to trust in Jesus, uh, we would love to talk with you. We want to know that you uh, really understand the gospel, and if you do, we would love for you to be uh, baptized as a representation of your new birth uh, by the Spirit. So please uh, come and chat with us about that. Uh, we're not going to grill you or anything, just kind of hear about your, your new walk with Christ so that we can celebrate with you and uh, get you lined up to be celebrated by this church body when we go out to beach baptism. So uh, please come talk to us. As I said, it's coming up next week. So now is, now is the time if you'd like to be baptized at the beach. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, hey, just a reminder, uh, every uh, Wednesday night, or I should say, depending on the number of weeks in the month, uh, um, you know, depending on which week it is, we have men's and women's ministries uh, that meet on Wednesday nights. Uh, and so the men are meeting on the first and third Wednesday. The women are meeting on the second and the fourth uh, Wednesdays. And that's just a, man, you know, I'll be honest, like it's kind of a low attended thing uh, right now for our church family, but it's a really great time uh, of encouragement, at least for the men. I think it is from uh, for the women, from what I have Heard. And so if you're getting, you know, if you'd like to get to know people better within this church body or just build some uh, maybe closer friendships with some men or women respectively, um, then now if you're like a single guy, like don't be like, I want to build a relationship with a, you know, nice young single. Don't go to women's ministry. Okay. It's like, it's, you know, men or women <laughs> respectively. But uh, uh, anyway, please come out to those. Uh, it, it's a really great time. We, uh, we are discipled together. We worship together. Um, and we fellowship together. It's a really good time. So please, men's and women's ministries, you can find that info on our website. Uh, We also post about it on social media quite a bit, also on the Church Center app. It's everywhere. So please, we'd love for you to join us. But all right, Uh, this week uh, is week two of a new teaching series through the Old Testament book of Daniel. Last week, we spent the majority of our time discussing the contextual backdrop of Daniel, which was the Babylonian exile. Uh, the Babylonian exile, really quick, was just a, it was a dark, sad, and confusing time for the nation of Israel when after many, many, many years of sinful disobedience to God in which he lovingly warned his people to repent, he finally enacted divine discipline on them by allowing a foreign nation, Babylon, to come and to conquer them 
and haul them off into a foreign land hundreds of miles away. If you missed that message last week and you want to hear about the context of the Babylonian exile, uh, it is published on our YouTube channel. You can go check out check it out there with all our other sermons. But today, we're going to get into actually talking about the man that this book was written by, Daniel. Uh, and as I uh, think we'll quickly see today, Daniel has a lot to teach us about living faithfully in Babylon. So let's uh, read our text and pray for God's help, and then we're going to see what we can see. I think we're going to see a lot. We're going to read all of uh, Daniel chapter 1 this morning. So starting in verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of, and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray. Father, God, thank you for the good news of the gospel. That men and women who recognize that they have lived sinful lives of rebellion against you can now actually run to you and not away from you because you have made a way for them to be saved from the consequences of their sin in and through your perfect son, Jesus, who lived the life that we never could that he might impart his perfectly righteous record to our accounts, and who died the punitive death that we deserved, though he had no sin deserving of death, and thus who was able to take his life back up again in resurrection and prove to us and to the world that he is truly God, whose infinitely costly infinitely costly death, paid the price for our total forgiveness of sin and reconciliation back into your family if we would only place our faith in him. God, would we never forget that gospel and will we always preach it as the only way for men and women to be saved, especially as we talk at length in messages like today's about how to live as citizens of your kingdom in the midst of Babylon. Would we never forget that There is no one who will be saved 
by their resistance to Babylon alone. We need the grace and mercy of Christ alone to be saved. And then it is that grace and mercy extended to us that motivates and empowers us to live faithfully to you in this dying world. So as we look now, God, at the first chapter of Daniel today, would we admire him for how he does that so well and seek to emulate him as best we can to that end? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, a common plot theme for many a sci-fi movie is the terrifying prospect of an invisible, malevolent contagion that begins to spread by entering and hijacking people's minds and taking them captive one by one. We've all seen a bunch of movies like this, right? And you know how it always goes if you've seen those movies. They're will be like a holdout group who knows the danger of the virus, and so they're, they're trying to stick together, stay safe. But eventually, someone in the group starts acting funny. right? And then the things they're saying don't seem like them anymore until finally it becomes apparent they've been infected and they've been compromised by the virus. Well, last week... As we were defining Babylon, we established that Babylon, though a real historical place, becomes symbolic in Scripture for the kingdom of men who desire to live outside of the good and gracious rule of God. So we said that Babylon, in a symbolic sense, has a spirit or an ethos, a value system. And as we examine the value system of Babylon we see that the one behind this spiritual kingdom is none other than the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. In his hatred for God and God's image bearers, Satan has established a counterfeit to the kingdom of God in order to draw mankind away from God. Instead of being characterized by Light, as is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Babylon is characterized by darkness. Instead of purity, perversity. Instead of humility, pride. Instead of generosity, greed. Instead of truth, lies, and so on and so forth. And with this understanding of the spiritual demonic kingdom of Babylon that sets itself up up behind every great world power in history, we said last week that in America... As believers, we now know in all actuality that we are living in a modern day Babylon. And so what we see in Daniel chapter 1 with King Nebuchadnezzar trying to assimilate Daniel and his friends into Babylonian culture, this is still happening today. This is still happening today. Spiritual Babylon is still very much in the business of brainwashing. And so the first and overarching point I want to make from our passage today is that the greatest danger of Babylon is not living in it physically, but its subtle and seductive attempts to live inside of us spiritually. Now that's not to say there are zero physical hazards to living in Babylon. Of course there are. We live in a broken and sometimes scary world where unfortunately there are things like murder and human trafficking and fentanyl poisoning and whatnot, deviant criminal activities that sometimes break out from the sin of others and harm otherwise innocent bystanders. And let me be clear, the devil is pleased. The devil is pleased with things that lead to the physical death of human beings made in the image of God. He is quite pleased with that. But Satan knows that more flies are caught with honey than vinegar. And so the majority of his demonic work is focused on what we talked about earlier. Undercover, behind the scenes, subtly and seductively infecting people's hearts with a virus of sinful, anti-God culture. Because more so than 
the devil desires our physical death. He would much rather people choose to kick up their feet and to get comfortable in pagan living on the conveyor belt to eternal spiritual death. Like cattle, unknowingly on their way to the slaughter. Now that is where the devil is going, to hell. And he knows it. But in his rebellion against God, he wants to take as many of God's image bearers with him as he can. And so, you know, we read in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, the Apostle Paul speaking to the church says things like this. He says, But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Why does Paul tell us not to associate with someone like this who calls himself a brother in Christ and yet is living headlong in their sin, unrepentant? Well, it's because this is a portrait, if you will, of a Babylonian believer. And their duplicitous lifestyle is quite contagious. They call themselves a Christian, but they've been deceived by the kingdom of Babylon into thinking that nothing about them needs to change. Nothing about them needs to be different from the culture they live in. That on the surface, they can identify with Christ, but inwardly and in their daily lives, they can be carelessly enjoying the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, greed, drunkenness, all forms of idolatry. This is what it looks like for the spirit of Babylon to live inside of us. And as we'll see in just a moment from our text, this is no passive spirit. This is no passive spirit. It it desires to dominate, and it has an effective plan to do so if we don't live with vigilance, right? I think if we're honest after today, most of us will have to admit that in one way or another, this, this spirit, the spirit of Babylon, already has its tentacles trying to encroach into our hearts and lives to some degree or another. As Presbyterian pastor and theologian Sinclair Ferguson wisely and painfully asserts, he says, though we do not share all of the world's conclusions Too often we think about everything in the same way and operate with the same value system. How many of us would rather die for the glory of God than live half-heartedly for Him in a measure of comfort? No need to answer that rhetorical question. Just allow it to maybe turn over in your heart and mind as we now turn back to our passage to examine the clear strategy of the enemy and the propagation of his counterfeit kingdom. The second point in your notes today is that the demonic kingdom of Babylon wants to cause Christians to forget God with a process of systematic reprogramming. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is doing with these young Israelite men, Daniel and his three friends, but this is just an outworking. This is just an outworking of what Every manifestation of Babylon always does because this is what the true king of Babylon, Satan, this is what he does in his demonic work to mislead all people. He engages in a kind of anti-discipleship that started way back in the garden when he caught Eve by herself and deceitfully whispered for the first time, did God really say that? He's still doing this work. He's still doing this very same work of confusion today to cause even professing Christians to forget God. And in Daniel 1, I think we see four parts to this Babylonian systematic reprogramming scheme. It starts with isolating them. It starts with isolating them. Daniel and his friends, you should know contextually, they were teenagers maybe high school age kids, who had been carted off, perhaps forced to walk upwards of 700 miles from Israel to Babylon, separated from their homes and their families in a place that they had never been, 
where the people don't even speak their language. So they were alone. They were alone, and it's safe to assume they were probably afraid. And we too, as believers today, should have a healthy fear of isolation. In Proverbs, we see a strong warning against isolation. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire, and he breaks out against all sound judgment. This communicates the reality that when we are perpetually avoiding regular proximity with other believers who love us and desire to help us stay accountable, we become very susceptible to temptation, particularly the temptations of our own indwelling sin. The author of Hebrews, likewise, warns us against neglecting to meet together because, he says, regular meetings with God's people is something that keeps our hearts stirred up with godly desire to stay faithful in our walk with Christ. And though Daniel and his friends did not intentionally choose to be isolated, these same dangers were inevitably present for them. Church, how often... How often spiritual warfare seems to flare up when we're isolated. Out of town on a business trip, or at home alone when your family's away, or up late at night when the rest of your family is asleep, or in a season when you're in a hiatus from meeting regularly with other Christians for fellowship and discipleship. Doesn't this often seem to be when temptation strikes? Brothers and sisters, I assure you, this is not by chance. This is by design. This is by design. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Friends, we've all seen Animal Planet, right? Which zebra does the lion always go for? The one who's lagging behind the one who is vulnerable because it's isolated from the group. This is how Satan works. It's sick, it's twisted, but it's effective. And so this is why the demonic kingdom of Babylon wants people isolated. And what do we see in our own day? A culture that has led people to view engagement as virtual. The town square is no longer in public, it's online, where you can totally curate what people know about you and what they don't. You can easily hide in plain sight. We can all live like the the guy on the Zoom call. You remember during COVID, the guy on the Zoom call, he's wearing the suit jacket and the tie, sitting on his couch in his underwear for a business meeting. You remember that? This is how Babylon wants us. This is how Babylon wants us. Isolated and unknown with a simulated sense of 24-7 connection. All the while having our worldview manipulated by algorithms created by people who hate God. I'm just going to tell you, sometimes, I don't know if I've said this publicly, but sometimes I get asked if our church has a live stream. The answer is no, on purpose. Because while some people argue that a live stream gives you the opportunity to reach more people, Jesus already gave us a way to do that. It's called evangelism. Uh, I think instead, a live stream... It simultaneously creates a temptation for God's people to phone it in on Sunday mornings and not gather physically for worship with their church family just because they feel tired or they had a busy week. Look around you right now, folks. This is the tired crew that had a busy week. Amen? Amen? That's one of the reasons... Why we get up on Sunday mornings and come have physical corporate worship? Because we're tired and we're busy. We're tired and we're busy. 
And we need to be encouraged. And we need to be strengthened in our tiresome, hectic lives. We need to sing to Jesus. And we need to hear the voices of a hundred plus other believers in Christ singing their praises to him. Who are all tired and busy. Coffee in hand. Because Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. And the Bible says in Babylon, we can't afford to not do this. Now I know some people don't like that answer. Church growth gurus are like, you shouldn't say that. But you know what I don't like? Sorry, I didn't know I was going to yell today. You know what I don't like? <laughs> the fact that some professing believers in Christ are being deceived by the spirit of Babylon to think that frequent gatherings with their church are outdated, inconvenient, and unnecessary. That is not biblical. Gathering with other believers, maybe once or twice a month, is not enough. When the world is on fire, like it is right now, the Bible says you better not be skipping church. You need to be with the family of God and not be isolated. You need to be looking other believers in the eyes and talking about how you're doing, confessing struggles, celebrating victories, talking about what God is teaching you, praying for one another, hugging one another. Or bro-hugging, guys. That's okay, too. This is the, this is the Christian version of touching grass, as the kids say these days, okay? Now, if you're a spiritual Babylonian, you probably hate that I'm saying this. If you hate that I'm saying this, it's because you have been systematically programmed to see yourself as autonomous, an autonomous, unique individual who is the only one who is able to know what is best for yourself all the time. Look right at me. That is a lie. That is a lie that the spirit of Babylon sells to people so that they will feel good about living their lives in isolation and not having to listen to the counsel of anyone else other than their own heart. God knows what is best for you. And it's not isolation. It's not isolation. It's to live in tight-knit community with other Christians so that you don't get picked off by the enemy. But that's just step one of the process. Isolating them. Here's number two. Indoctrinating them. After Daniel and co. were isolated in the land of Shinar, the text says the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, get this, and to teach them, to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. They were to be educated for three years. At the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. So this... This is what totalitarian regimes always do, right? They forcibly re-educate. What was said? What was said to these young men over the course of three years in an attempt to rewire their thinking? I don't know. Maybe it went something like this. All that stuff you learned about your God, right? Forget all that. It doesn't matter. We'll teach you the things that really matter. So you can be a respectable member of society and not one of those backwoods Israelite fundamentalists. You need to be cultured, tolerant. There's not just one God. There are lots of gods, Daniel. And you need to respect that. Celebrate that even. Don't be a bigot with morals. The only convictions you need are pagan Babylonian convictions, which means whatever King Neb says, goes. He says jump, you say how high. Got it? Now, I'm just speculating. 
But again, what do we see in our own day? The normalization of secular, atheistic living and the demonization of Judeo-Christian religious living. The constant, aggressive barrage of a pagan worldview on TV, on social media, on billboards, mockery of the Christian faith in the opening ceremony of the Olympics, apparently in the newest Marvel movie. And we're supposed to act, we're supposed to kneel, to bow. We're supposed to apparently act like that's just totally fine with us. If you're offended, that's your own problem. They're just trying to be inclusive. And not only that, the culture insists that as Christians, we are to lay our faith aside and join in their version of inclusivity. That we not only tolerate sin, but that we celebrate it. We celebrate it. Because if you don't celebrate, if you won't celebrate the pride of the perverse agenda of the new sexual ethics of the LGBTQ plus movement, well, you must hate those people. You must hate those people. Also, while we're at it, you'd better celebrate abortion too. Because a woman killing her unborn child in the womb up to the moment of birth is now apparently the highest good. It's the highest good of a truly advanced society. And if you say otherwise, well, then you're just awful. You're just awful. How dare you have biblical beliefs? How dare you believe that truth is objective? How dare you think that there is such a thing as sin? So you know what they'll do? They'll just write us off as too far gone, as extremists. And they'll start over with our kids. They'll start over with our kids. Since education has largely been outsourced to the government already. That's why Nebuchadnezzar takes youths. Right? You see that? That's why he takes youths. Because children are impressionable, moldable. They have an element of innocence where they are more naturally trusting of the adults and authority positions in their life. Church, we must be on guard against the indoctrination of Babylon, which means we have got to be careful about what we're taking in, who we're listening to, what shows and books and podcasts we're digesting, and allowing them to inform our thinking. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one take, get this, no one takes you captive by philosophy. You think the Apostle Paul knew what he was talking about? See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it. No media, no media, not the Daily Wire, friends, not even conservative media, okay? No media that is produced in this world is neutral. It's created by people with agendas who want to persuasively bring other people into those agendas. There are spirits at work behind every talking head on both sides of the political aisle, every political candidate, every Netflix show, every movie, and most of them, the great majority of them, are not in submission to Christ. They're anti-Christ, actually. And we must not be naive about how over time, the spirit of Babylon plays the long game. (laughs) They know they're not going to shift your beliefs in one week. They know that. But in a year, in two years, in 10 years, if they put a laugh track under the sexually immoral situations of every sitcom for 20 years, pretty soon there's no resistance left. They've normalized it. That's where we are today. That's what has been done. That's where we are today. Which again is why we have instructions like 
Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Church, I'm not going to harp on this because I do it all the time and we have too much to cover today, but we must seek to be continually formed by the word of God and not the pagan culture around us. And we must protect our children and see to it that they too are formed by God's word as well. Whether that means homeschooling, or whether that means private Christian schooling, or just if you're just being really intentional with your kids who are in public school, sometimes that's the way to go. But it, it definitely means consistent family worship, filling their minds with the stories of Jesus in the Gospels and how they apply to them. Why they need Jesus, just like we need Jesus. Singing solid worship songs with them at home and in the car. If you're like my kids, solid Christian rap. (laughs) Sometimes. Praying with them daily. Hey, some of those rappers have better theology than Caleb. But anyway, um, (laughs) praying with them, that's for free. Praying with them daily. (laughs) Discipling them in love. But also, don't miss this, talking to them about what they're seeing in the world around them, guarding them from having the world's values imposed on them, but not sheltering them in the sense of leaving them totally unaware and defenseless against what the world teaches. They're going to have to go out there sometime. We need them to be able to identify and refute the world's teaching with clarity as they get older. Babylon will indoctrinate us, and it will much more easily and quickly indoctrinate our children if we fail to disciple them. The enemy has plenty of people who will step in for you to disciple your kids gladly. This is a huge part of the Babylonian mission, to confuse and warp the innocent hearts and minds of our children. Dear Christian, this is a spiritual war that we cannot afford to not be actively fighting. But even that's not all. We see from the spirit of Babylon with Daniel and his friends, that first it isolates them, it seeks to indoctrinate them, and it also redefines them. Daniel and his friends all have amazing spiritual meaning behind their Jewish names. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. Mishael means who is what God is. Azariah means the Lord is our helper. And the first thing that happens when they get to Babylon is they're given new names. That instead of giving glory and honor to Yahweh, Give honor to pagan gods, Marduk, Baal, Nebo. And as if that wasn't demeaning enough, the hard truth is, in order to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court, history tells us that one would have to become a eunuch. This is really a pride thing for kings, so they didn't feel like their male servants posed any real threat to them. If you're not sure what a eunuch is, I'm not sure I want to explain it. So look it up, look it up in the dictionary if your parents will let you. Um, But all of that to say, Babylon robbed these young men of their primary identifying marker, their names, which anchored them to their faith, but they were also emasculated and robbed of any opportunity to be men in their lives as they would have expected in the sense of getting married, having children, As an aside, it's at this point that I just can't help but point out, we, church, we have hardly suffered. We, many of us have not suffered. Not like Daniel. How Daniel went on to live a faithful life after all of this as a teenager is beyond my imagination. Church, this should humble and encourage us. Surely we can be faithful in much less challenging circumstances. But anyway, back to the point. While it's safe to presume that none of us have had to go through 
this extreme form of cultural re-identification. Once again, there is still a sense in which our culture does want to identify us on its terms. You know that? We are nearly forced into the mold of identifying ourselves by what we do for a living, how much money we make, where we live, and so forth. All things that have been fashioned into modern idols in our culture, we are taught that position, possession, power, and status, that's where you find your worth. When in truth, just like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we should not find our identity in these materialistic temporal values of the world, but as believers in Christ, we are to find our identity in who God is and what he has done for us. As blood-bought children of God for whom Christ died, as ambassadors for Christ in a foreign land to advance the good news of his kingdom, you may be a soldier, you may be a stay-at-home mom, you may be a manager, you may be a whatever, fill in the blank with what your vocation is. That's what you do to secure provision, but you are a disciple of Christ first. And you are in that role to live out your true mission of making more disciples. You have a boss, and you should do your best to work hard for and do the will of your boss, so long as it crosses no moral and ethical lines. But your boss has a boss, and his name is Jesus. And you report to him, and you submit to him over and above everyone else. Babylon wants us to identify with what we do. We must continue to identify with the deeper reality of who we are as image bearers of God and what he has done for us in Christ. Not to mention, not to mention there's more, our culture's attempts to erode traditional gender roles of male and female, but also even further, to eliminate the reality of gender itself, and in particular, in particular, making biblical manhood out to seem like some great source of evil in the world when it was meant to be seen as a God-given role worthy of dignity and respect. The title of patriarch just a hundred years ago would have been one treated with reverence, a family leader, a husband, a father who was strong physically and spiritually and thus who could and should be honored, trusted, looked up to for wisdom and guidance. And now our culture only uses the term pejoratively, down with the patriarchy preferring that men would instead operate like practical eunuchs who fall in line, who sit down and shut up, and who pose no threat to the demonic agenda of Babylon. While also while also telling women that men are basically useless and that the height of female dominance is either to be objectified by men or to just rid your life of them altogether. And that really flows right into the final step of this reprogramming process. When it comes to the people of God, Babylon wants to isolate them, indoctrinate them, re-identify them, and finally it wants to intoxicate them. The text says that Daniel and his friends were to be fed with the king's food and the king's wine. That is the best of the best. Filet every day. So while they were slaves in the sense that they were taken against their will, they were not treated poorly, you see. They were treated like royalty. They were living in the king's house, had access to the king's delicacies. Think about this. As young men who were being groomed to be assistants to the most powerful ruler in the world at that time, there was very little off limits for them. And again, this was very calculated. The king wanted them well-fed and happy so they would be loyal to him alone and his policies And again, the same is true, friends. The same is true of the demonic ruler of this world today. Think of how he tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness with food, power, and comfort. He wants us intoxicated. He wants us inebriated. He wants us to pursue worldly pleasure without inhibition. Food, alcohol, sex, entertainment, whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want. He wants us to have a YOLO mentality, which is just the modern version of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He wants us living like practical atheists who don't ever think about the fact 
that everything good that we have is from God and who don't ever think about how God has instructed us to actually live our lives. Because like we said a few moments ago, kings don't want opposition. They want submission. And so Satan, the true king behind Babylon in Daniel's day as well as our day, wants professing Christian men distracted and impotent. Do you hear that? Man, you have an enemy who wants you distracted and impotent. He wants us piddling around, wasting all of our time in the fantasy worlds of pornography and video games, preoccupied with trinkets and toys like children. He wants us sleeping on the divine critical mission we've been, get, we've been given of loving our wives and leading our families and making disciples. He wants us spiritually fat and lazy and content with the status quo of the pagan culture, talking incessantly about the strategies of fantasy football or politics and not once mentioning our strategies to reach other men for Christ. He wants our wives consuming a steady diet of trash reality TV shows and modern romance novels, daydreaming about unattainable Instagram influencer lifestyle so they will resent us and spurn any attempts of our leadership. And he wants our kids, he wants our kids to never be engaged by us at the emotional and spiritual level, but to have their eyes glued to screens from infancy, growing more estranged to us every day, preferring the same kind of isolation and materialistic consumption that sadly we've modeled for them so many times, so that when they're older and they're faced with the most important life decisions, we're the last ones they think to come to. And Satan, frankly, has been so successful at this. He has been so successful at this. He has created something that never existed in the time of the Bible. In the Bible, at 13, it was time to grow up. It was time to be a man or to be a woman. In our culture, we glorify perpetual adolescence, where from the ages of about 16 to 30, sometimes it starts earlier, sometimes it lasts longer, but people in our culture are trained to think, this is totally normal. This is totally right for us. For the better part of two decades of our young life, when we have the most strength and vitality to have all the freedom of an adult while maintaining the immaturity and the lack of responsibility of a child. Staying up late, playing games, drinking, and often being promiscuous, sleeping in late, working just enough to support that lifestyle, delaying marriage, and viewing children largely as an inconvenience. And then when you finally are forced to grow up, he wants you living for the weekend and dreaming about the day when you can retire. And once again, go back to doing minimal work and have another decade or so to be distracted by golf or travel or collecting seashells or whatever. Church, is this what we want? Is this what we want? If so, we want to be intoxicated by Babylon because this lifestyle is nowhere promoted in the pages of Scripture. In fact, just the opposite. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And how often do we say this here, that while it is absolutely sinful to be using alcohol to get drunk, there are many, other things people use to intoxicate themselves, to numb and distract themselves to the most important spiritual realities of life. Hence all the New Testament commands, not just to be sober, but to be sober-minded, to walk by the Spirit and not according to the flesh, and to fix our eyes on the hope of the gospel so that we might truly live as Christians, not Babylonians. Babylon... Babylon wants us isolated from God's people. Babylon wants us indoctrinated 
and the values of its pagan culture. Babylon wants us re-identified with the material world, and Babylon wants us intoxicated with the fleeting pleasures of sin. But Daniel, one of the greatest Old Testament examples we have, says no. He says no. With godly defiance, Daniel resists the spirit of Babylon while he had no choice in the matter of having to live in Babylon. He refused to allow Babylon to live inside of him. And so as we close, let's talk about three aspects of Daniel's example that we should strive to emulate. First of all, Daniel's example teaches us that there is usually a way to coexist peaceably in Babylon while defying its influence at the heart level. But it takes wisdom to discern and determination to implement. We see this in the way that Daniel resolves not to defile himself, and then he asks for permission from the chief eunuch to not partake in the king's food. Jesus famously prays for us in his high priestly prayer that his, as his disciples we would live in this very same way. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's Satan, the king of Babylon. This is where we get the expression to be in the world, but not of the world. Daniel makes this resolution in his heart that even though he can't control his external geographical location, he can control his internal theological commitments. For some of us, this is our problem. For some of us, this is our problem. We have not resolved in our hearts to not defile ourselves, either because in spiritual immaturity we have never even realized the distinction that needs to be made, that we should be different from the world, or because in our sin, if we're honest, the truth is, is that we love the king's food, or we love the king's wine, or we love some aspect of life in the kingdom of Babylon. Some of us need to turn off the indoctrination of social media to get our faces away from the screen and get our faces into God's word. Because the primary reason some of us don't know how we should be different is we're not reading the manual. We're not reading the manual. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You have to open the book. You have to give effort. It's not easy living faithfully in Babylon. It's not easy resisting the spirit of this world. It takes godly determination. Some of us, though, are busy. How you doing? Oh, so busy. Some of us are so busy with everything other than being involved with our church. And if we created a true chart of our time, and we did a little bit of work with our priorities, it would expose not, on, not, not, that we, not that we don't have time, but that we're wasting much of our time with things that don't matter. And so we've been deceived into believing that isolation is our only option. Again, this takes determination. This takes being honest with ourselves. And some of us don't really want that. We don't want to be confronted with the fact that we alone are culpable for our lack of commitment to the Lord. We want to say it's because we're victims. We're the victims of busyness, and we just can't help it. You can help it. You can help it. Assess your time and your priorities. We all have about 112 waking hours a week, considering we should be sleeping eight a day. Maybe, you, maybe you're one of those weirdos that only needs five or six, and you have more time, like my wife. <laughs> Being an active part of corporate worship, community, and discipleship is going to take about six hours of your time a week. About six hours of your time a week. And then let's say you want to spend 40 minutes a day in the Word and in prayer. That's about four more hours, so 10 hours a week. Can you do that? If you think you're not able to swing that, I encourage you to check the screen time report on your iPhone and get back to me. But still, the problem for others of us is that we have, we have a Babylonian idol set up behind a curtain in our hearts somewhere whose defilement we secretly love. Pornography or shopping 
or some all-consuming hobby that we are refusing to give up. We're obsessed with it. We can't let it go. But whatever it is that is causing us to be defiled and not fully devoted to Christ, guys, if it's overtly sinful, it needs to go. We need to give those things up. And if it's just ignorance or lack of thought or lack of spiritual maturity about what faithfulness looks like, we need to pause here and take inventory. Ephesians 5, 7 through 10 says, Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Maybe you need some help with that. That's okay. There are plenty of brothers and sisters in Christ here who would be happy to help with that. There is not a perfect man or woman in this room. By God's grace, there are many of us who have sought the Lord's wisdom and worked to discern how we could coexist peaceably in Babylon while not bowing our hearts to its king and not defiling our lives with its programming. Usually, stay with me, I know, take a sip of coffee. Usually, there's a way. Usually, there's a way. And Daniel shows us that even where there seems to not be a way, God makes it work out. Later in the book, we'll see that Daniel had to actually break the law to be obedient. And sometimes that may be the case. But usually, if we just ask God for wisdom and we commit ourselves to actually be obedient, there is a way. There is a way. Daniel asked permission. Under great threat of physical harm, the chief eunuch who wanted to help Daniel said he was afraid he might lose his head. Anybody else in that situation? Don't raise your hand. You're not. But most of the things... Most of the things that we could do don't even require permission. They just require desire. By God's grace, again, in America, we are still free, friends. We're still free to abstain from the programming of Babylon. The question is, are we willing? Are we willing? Are you willing to delete the app? Are you willing to turn off the TV? Are you willing to ask for help? Are you willing to get some accountability? Are you willing to spend time with the Lord? Are you willing to come to church every week? Are you willing to take a few things off your calendar that you don't need to be doing so you can be devoted to the things that really matter? Are you willing? Are you willing? The biggest problem for American Christians is they say, I can't. And what they really mean is I won't. I won't. There's usually a way to coexist peaceably in Babylon while defying its influence at the heart level, but it takes wisdom to discern and it takes determination to implement. Are you willing? That's number one. Here's lesson two from Daniel. While God does not promise to protect us from experiencing suffering, he does promise to preserve and provide for us through it. Maybe you're here today and Again, by, the God's, by God's grace, you, you feel like your, your biggest problem right now is not some sin, it's suffering in your life. You're suffering. Maybe you're willing to be faithful, you desire to be faithful, but you just feel like some of the difficulties of exile are soul-crushing to you. Maybe your marriage is broken, or your children are wayward, or your job feels miserable, or sickness and death have come for your family and friends. These are all very real problems that even Christians must face and that God does not promise to just make go away in this life. And I'm certainly not minimizing whatever you may be enduring, but we must look again to Daniel as it's almost certain that none of us have had it as hard as him. And yet listen to these final verses of chapter 1. It says, And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. First of all, God was with Daniel. God was with Daniel, even in his immense suffering and loss. And God not only was with Daniel, but he gave Daniel and his friends great favor and caused them to do very well for themselves, allowing them to be taken care of so that they could be his witnesses in the midst of an otherwise unimaginably 
dark and difficult life, God is able to do the same for us. Not to take us out of suffering, but to be noticeably with us, giving us favor in the midst of our suffering and showing that if we have him, then we have everything that we need. 2 Corinthians 4, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God will get us through our spiritual exile of this life, and he will keep us faithful until he returns to take us home. The final verse of Daniel 1 says that God preserved Daniel all the way to the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. Now, you might just read past that, but the reason this should be striking is because King Cyrus is not a Babylonian king. He's a Persian king. God literally allowed Daniel to outlive Babylon, and he will empower us to outlive Babylon the spiritual reign of Babylon in our time as well. Isaiah 43 says, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I and the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. What an encouragement. While God does not promise to protect us from experiencing suffering, he does promise to preserve and provide for us through it. But the final lesson that we'll end with is this. Someone is saying hallelujah inwardly. We we not only need faithful, exilic examples to follow, we need perfect faithfulness lived out for us. Daniel is a peculiar character in Scripture because he is the only man in Scripture with the exception of Christ whose sin goes unmentioned. I think that's not because Daniel was without sin, but because his life is meant to point us to the one who truly is without sin, the Lord Jesus. So while we should learn many lessons from Daniel about how to resist the spirit of Babylon, the gospel message is this, All of us have been compromised by the sins of Babylon to some degree or another, and we cannot defeat it on our own. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. As the very Son of God, Jesus came to live a perfectly sinless life in exile, away from his Father, away from his heavenly home. And then on the cross, Jesus died the death that sinful Babylonian believers like us deserve. And then he was raised from the dead, defeating death, defeating the demon king of Babylon, and promising to return one day at the end of time to save all who place their faith in him and to chuck Babylon Babylon along with its king into the lake of fire while we go on to live with King Jesus forever in a new heaven and a new earth unstained by Babylon. So while the main message of this passage is that we should absolutely resist the spirit of Babylon, the overarching message of Scripture that Daniel fits into is, if you want to be saved from Babylon, finally and fully, you need Jesus for that. You need Jesus for that. Romans 4 says, For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Daniel, just like Abraham, believed the promises of God, and thus he was counted righteous. So if you too know that if you're honest, you have been defiled by Babylon, and you want to be counted as righteous, you can. You can. Because the promise of the gospel is that God justifies the ungodly by faith alone in Jesus. I pray that you'll remember that if you're a believer already or that you would believe that for the first time today if you've never heard that gospel. 
And then like Daniel and his friends, God empowers us to overcome Babylon by his grace. Let's pray. Father, this is a long, difficult section of scripture, but God, it is rich and it is so relevant. It's so helpful for where we are in this world, in this exile, in the midst of spiritual Babylon. God, I pray that we would remember that we cannot defeat Babylon on our own. The first thing that we need is we need Jesus, the one who is going to crush the king of Babylon in the end and going to do away with Babylon forever. God, we need Christ. We need to be saved by him. But we also need to learn to live in the midst of spiritual Babylon in faithfulness. God, I pray that we would learn that throughout this series, that we would grow in that throughout this series, that we would that we would dare to be a Daniel, God. That we would see the lessons that he teaches us with his faithful life and that we would strive to implement them ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.